celebrating many more years in the business than our stylists would want us to remember, share the farewell tour in 45 minutes here on BBC One. How do we sit back and imagine? I'll ring you because I might come to one. This man is stalking me. He's waiting for my phone to ring. He's obsessed with people on mobile phones. So far, he's taken over 10,000 images of them all over the world. He's also photographed fairy cakes, cups of tea, and the backs of people's heads. In fact, the more mundane the image, the more it excites him. These pictures have helped make him one of the most influential of all contemporary photographers. Oh, hi, Lorraine. My job. Yeah. His name is Martin Parr, and he can't stop taking photographs. Did you like that trail? Good. Good. Despite their often surreal and quintessentially English subject matter, Martin Parr's pictures have enjoyed huge international acclaim. This is the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, home to some of the greatest works of modern art, from Picasso to Bacon. Currently, it's hosting a major retrospective of Parr's work. An entire floor of the museum has been devoted to the show, which will then go on tour all over Europe. Earlier this year, Parr's pictures were also bought by the Tate Gallery for the National Collection. The images in this exhibition have been captured by Parr over a period of 30 years. I'm fascinated by his eye. Here the ordinary somehow becomes extraordinary. So what is it about Martin Parr that makes him so distinctive? He is the photographer who in uh, 50 years time people will look back and, and look at his pictures and say that somehow or another he's managed to encapsulate the sort of vulgarity in a strange sort of way of, of this period. I think Martin is, is undoubtedly one of the great British photographers. I mean, he follows exactly in that tradition of Bill Brandt and um, the street photographers of the 19th century, people, and, and of course of Tony Ray Jones in the post-war period of people who went out and looked at Britain and um, documented um, the way we live. 
But Parr is not simply a documentary photographer. He never stands back to observe the world. There's always a point of view. Are you consciously looking for, for these surreal moments as well in your pictures? Are you interested in the surreal? I, surreal things are important. I mean, we're surrounded by things that are surreal, just we don't see it because you know, familiarity breeds contempt. So if you look at our own lives, what we do, who we are, uh, where we live, it's all quite strange and weird and surreal, but we don't see it because we're just living with it. So where does it all come from, this very particular vision of the world? I'm a home counties kid, you know, I mean, I'm as suburban as you can get. I regard a blandness of suburbia as an essential part of my upbringing and indeed who I am now. I think the kind of suburbia that Martin came from is really, really important because it wasn't that kind of high, glorious suburbia of tall hedges and um, doors with, uh, with stained glass. It wasn't that kind of suburbia. It was this very dull, sprawling, out of Surrey suburbia where nothing happens and there's maybe a kind of rather miserable little shop every so often and, and there's no centre to anything. Oh, this is it. Oh, -ho. mind the steps. I think we moved from Chessington to Ashford around 1961 or two, and I left home in 1970. So it'll be seven or eight years here. Wow. Well, this is my uh, bedroom basically, and um, on these walls here, this is where you can see my black and white abstract paintings. I can't remember where the bed was, was it here? But I would hide myself away with my friends. We'd even smoke up here. Yeah, it was my own little world, really. <laughs> Just gonna get that corner where I was sat. It's very interesting when you look at photographers' backgrounds. They were often, they were often people who had maybe not un terribly unhappy childhoods, but often quite dull ones where they felt quite disassociated from from other people. And they often didn't do very well academically. A lot of photographers didn't do very well academically at all. So they became these kind of lost people. And I think the act of taking photographs it distances you from the world because you've got partly you've got an excuse for being there because you're the photographer and uh, partly the camera is an interface or a barrier or a gateway to the rest of the world so And the surreal nature of, uh, of 
of this sort of long-standing encounter. I would have thought this amount of eastern stuff that's come through in recent weeks. I can't believe there's not been something found in Beaulieu Wood. Hersham Sewage Works was running straight by the, the main London to um, Bournemouth uh, track, and that's when I became a train spotter. It's really this whole idea of um, uh, the fact that I go around sort of spotting things, if you like, comes from my father, the, the genes that he had that made him such a, an obsessional bird watcher, I think are the same genes that I've inherited that made me such an obsessional photographer. What I'm doing when I'm photographing is collecting ideas, collecting bits of information, uh, and as well as collecting things physically, you know, I've collected together millions of photographs over my career. And sometimes you can put these together and make some sense out of the world and, and put them into projects. This installation, recreated in the Madrid exhibition, was Parr's first major project, his college degree show from 1974. It's called Home Sweet Home. He exhibited the photographs he'd been taking in a living room environment, surrounded by the mundane details of domestic life that have fascinated him ever since. And then in the mid-70s, Pa left his suburban roots behind to begin a new life in Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire. In 90, 1898, <laughs> our childhood days were very happy. Hard working, honest people, little or no education, not much money and not much to spend it on either. Martin had this terrific um, relationship, almost a, a sort of love affair with the north of England because he'd visited there um, to stay with his grandfather up near Bradford and his grandfather had taught him photography and he I think he always associated the north since then with both a place of kind of warmth and comfort and community but also the place where he began to take photographs so um, when he moved up from suburban Surrey he immediately started to, to try and find this lost sense of communities so he went and found all the quirky things about Northern Life, the Allotment Society, the Hempecked Husbands League. And then, in a way, re recreated a history for himself within that photography. You didn't just move to Hempton Bridge. You immersed yourself in every aspect of life there for five years. Why? What were you looking for? I moved to Hebden Bridge along with three to four other colleagues from Manchester Polytechnic, uh, and we set up a workshop there. So there's a painter, a ceramicist, an architect, uh, and we got this um, shop premises on Albert Street, and we created the Albert Street workshop, and I was there for five years. When I moved there in 74, 75, it still did have a mill. Uh, I mean, it still was basically a town that made corduroy, and, uh, you know, it didn't have the tourism now. I mean, when you go to Hebden Bridge now, Sunday's the busiest day. When I moved there, all the shops were shut on Sunday. So the role of Hebden Bridge has changed enormously in this past 30 years as well. And I was trying to capture traditional aspects of life. I got very attracted to and interested in these small Methodist chapels that were up on the hills above Hebden Bridge and over a period of years documented these very carefully and very thoroughly. And these, in a sense, captured this whole idea of the traditional aspect of working class life that was quickly disappearing in that part of uh, Yorkshire or indeed anywhere. And you know, I went there to very much celebrate these sort of institutions uh, in their dying days. What a difference we have seen in our lifetime. What great changes we have seen. We have seen the development of electricity, the introduction of the motor car, the radio, the television, 
their way. And now we are rocketing men into the, into the sky to circle the Earth in outer space. There never were such changes as we have seen. It's almost as if that the, the, there's a kind of mythologizing of, of Hebden Bridge, and there's a touch of David Lynch about it as well, I suspect, in, its, in, its, in the way that you capture that community, that picture at night of the lights, very fair, a kind of fairy tale picture. It was a time where he really wanted to belong to something, which as a suburban child, you don't belong to anything. For him, it was, um, it was almost like kind of finding something that had, that had been lost, which he'd never had. I think more than anything else, it was the, the sense of community that I experienced in Yorkshire. I mean, I was amazed at the way people would just drop in and out of each other's houses. You'd go down to my grandfather's allotments and there'd be chat you go to the bread shop and they'd know your name. Uh, and I think that aspect of the community, which you didn't really see so much in suburban Surrey, was the thing that really attracted me. But then, after four years, Parr's Hebden Bridge project came to an abrupt end. Martin was this great, tall, strapping hippie. To go into the, that kind of community and to think that you can somehow just become part of it, while also wanting to, to use it for your purposes, to photograph it. And, and Martin and his wife Susie, they, they made a lot of tape recordings. They got deeply involved. I think, it was, I think it was a mistake that you maybe only make when you're, you know, you're 20. One of the people that we had a very good relationship with was someone called Stanley Greenwood. And in fact, we ended up having quite a, an argument with him. Because we'd been so involved in the chapel, uh, I think he felt a disappointment that we we were there because we were documenting it rather than thinking about um, trying to continue the tradition of the chapel. And this led to a, a breakdown with Stanley in particular. And I suppose this is one of the things that made me think that however involved you get, you can never be part of the thing that you're photographing. And I, I imagine that in my career after, I've never had that intensity of, of connection with a subject matter that I managed to get in Hebden Bridge. We are a party which honours the past that we may build for the future. Half a mile below the wet streets lies the seam of coal on which the town's poor fortunes are literally built. Old industries are declining, new ones are taking their place. Traditional jobs are being taken over by computers. People are choosing to spend their money in new ways. It would be foolish to pretend that this transition can be accomplished without problems. In the early half of the 1980s, while traditional photojournalists turned their cameras on Britain's scenes of social unrest, Martin Parr chose to look at the Thatcher years from a more oblique angle. He went to the seaside town of New Brighton near Liverpool to work on a series of pictures that would take three years to complete. Last Resort is an incredible contrast with what you were doing before, particularly in the early days. Tell me what you went to capture. Remember, this is in the early 80s when Mrs. Thatcher was at her absolute prime and she was telling us what a great country we were again. So there was a, a political element and input into this whereby I was trying to demonstrate that, um, you know, although she was telling us we were great, you know, if, if you actually look around in these sort of run-down northern cities, Liverpool being the prime example, it wasn't as good as she was telling us it was. Uh, here was this place, very shabby, very down at heel, full of litter, full of crap. 
and yet people still had to use it as a place to take the family to the kids. So really what I was trying to demonstrate was this kind of contrast between domestic activity and domestic normal life in this backdrop of litter and the fabric of the place you know, slowly disintegrating. I will never tire of the English seaside. There's something about it. When I think about, say, Britain or in particular England, it, it feels more English than perhaps the interior. It's almost as if it's uh, in a slight time warp and uh, it's got all the contradictions that I like. It's, it's sort of slightly sad and slightly decaying. Uh, you know, it, its peak of popularity is over. It's a bit like one of those uh, very clever alternative comedians, you know, a, a, a photographic version where he's having to kind of always slightly adjust the script. But, you know, the, the script is very much, you know, uh, playing on certain things that kind of amuse the audience and also make them rather uneasy. Um, and, you know, it involves a large amount of poking fun at subjects, sometimes, you know, amiably, sometimes very cruelly. Now, when I look at those pictures, I do see a kind of... It make you laugh and smile, but I saw them with some affection, and I saw the eye affectionately, but a lot of people didn't feel that about those pictures, did they? You were quite severely criticised by some. Well, the funny thing is, I mean, we, we opened the show in Liverpool um, at the Open Eye Gallery. Um, everyone knows in Liverpool what New Brighton was like. It was never a problem. Uh, this same show then opened in London and further afield and suddenly people were up in arms. You know, how dare this middle class photographer come along and exploit the working classes? Uh, and it's just interesting that people did not really know what was happening in the north of England. So when they saw these pictures, they immediately thought that this is a, an affront on uh, morality and exploitation. To a certain extent, all photography is, is exploitation. You know, he's very quick on his feet, so he, he knew he could see the way things were going. And by producing his kind of somewhat wacky colour photography at a time when there was still a kind of slightly retro feeling about, you know, reportage, photojournalism, and it should all be in black and white and so on. So he was kind of immediately attractive to magazine editors because of, a, you know, because of his new stance. He also realised that this was a time when um, the kind of slight, slight ironic um, satirical approach was becoming very attractive to people and um, in a way it was a bit of self-parody too which was also very much the spirit of the times. Flush from his commercial success, Parr moved yet again to Bristol where he lives to this day in an elegant Georgian townhouse. The inside is a shrine to his twin obsessions, the photographic image and the disposable ephemera of everyday life. This, this house is absolutely packed with stuff, isn't it? I know. I, I feel guilty. You don't feel guilty. You just imagine me as your confidant. Perfect. If you come in... Right, can... close the door. Yes, right. bigger house. I know. Right, so this is um, a box of wallpaper. Here's, here's probably one of the prize um, ones, Concord wallpaper. Ooh. Now, this is made when it was first introduced. Nice. E.T. Nice, certainly. So I've been collecting wallpaper for... Yes, how long for? 30 years. 30 years of That's wallpaper. That's skateboarding. We do have a few battles about it. Sometimes things get a bit out of control, you know, and you can see the piles of stuff mounting up. 
So we often have conversations about, you know, where on earth are we going to put all these books and things that he, he accumulates? Um, should we buy another house in order to store them all? OK, let's roll that up. Careful with this. I am being careful. I know you are. Somewhere in here is a box of Spice Girls ephemera. What I'm discovering is that nothing is too obscure for the Martin Parr collection, and nothing gets thrown away. Old magazines? Yep. Trouble is, I don't know where they are. Isn't it never-ending, really, basically, once you start? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a problem. I have a problem, really. Yeah. What can I do? Once you start these things, you, it's difficult to sort of give it up. Ah. Ah. Oh. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think this might be it. Assistance. Yes. Right. Spice Girls mm -hmm. Ephemera. Collection number 27. Put them here. I hope this is worth the wait. But in fact, it's not all Spice Girls. That's some um, underpants with footballs on. See, um, anything it's got a photograph on, I'm naturally attracted to it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Some of these are even advertising. They're arriving every day. Susie gets really um, paranoid when the postman comes with yet another tray. So I haven't looked at these two together. I think they're from the same set. Yes, they are, look. Gosh. These are ones with... Are they still photographic reproduction, do you think? Uh, yeah, it's a photograph. That's the only thing that counts. Sadly, I went and bought the same one twice because I just forgot I had it already. Oh, what a shame. I suppose... I've got a swap now. You've got a tray you want to swap with me? Uh, I, you know, I don't collect trays. <laughs> That's strange, isn't it? <laughs> And finally, the pièce de résistance, the Saddam Hussein collection. So it's really this idea of how photographs enter our society as a black and white one. So sort of Saddam through the ages? Yeah. See, look, there's um, Bin Laden on the front and then Saddam inside. Oh, oh whammy. my God, yes. <laughs> right. Careful. Okay, stop it. <laughs> Seriously, me. Oh. <laughs> I didn't mean to drop it, I'm sorry. <laughs> <coughs> I'm rather overwhelmed. <laughs> I can see. Yes. Oh, he is quite an obsessive character. One track mind and he knows exactly what he what he wants to do and what he wants to gather. And I think that's part of the reason why he's so good at what he does. He just has absolutely unswervingly followed his instinct. Uh, uh, kind of, it was a kind of tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, just getting on and not really bothering too much about what people think about him. Martin Parr's single-mindedness is what motivates him, but it's also made him something of an outsider in the photographic world. He almost willfully doesn't fit in, but there's no sign of self-consciousness about anything he does. Well, one of the things I collect are prostitute cards. And basically, whenever I'm in a in London and walking past the phone box, so I'd have a quick look in and just take any new ones that I don't have. They've got to have photographs on. But just as Parr's work can be both playful and profound, behind the ingenue exterior is a shrewd and determined strategist. Hello, Magnum. Oh, hi. These are the London offices of Magnum, the most prestigious photographic agency. Set up as a cooperative in 1947, it represents around 50 of the greatest names in photojournalism, from Don McCullen to Henri Cartier-Bresson. Martin Parr put himself forward for membership in the mid-80s. But they took a long time considering your application. Uh, it was quite contentious. Uh, I, I decided I want to try and join an agency because it struck me that, uh, you know, I had these pictures, many, many pictures over a 20-year period built up, and these were being underexploited. And because at heart I'm a populist, I'm interested in getting my work out to, you know, as big an audience as I can manage. I thought I needed an agency's help to achieve this. Magnum is a very flick in a way and it's taste it the thing of whether some earn more money than others whether this person's a jew or an arab or a, has some other different culture never comes up in magnum but there is no doubt that uh, by and large i would think that magnum is considered a, a left-wing 
kind of group of people. I think the majority of people have that kind of left-wing, very humanistic thing. Um, and there's no doubt that the pictures that Martin showed were considered by some people to be rather Thatcherite. And, and one of the books he did did actually look as though working class people are, are all scruffy, dirty, rather unintelligent people, you know. I'm told I'm the most controversial new member they've ever taken on, that there was um, a, a lot of people, a lot of the older members of Magnum took a particular dislike to my work, and uh, it became a very heated uh, debate. This is uh, my mother's tissue box. Malvern. What does that image say to you? It's very English, don't you think? I think quite a few of the, you know, the older statesmen of Magnum were a bit surprised themselves that he was accepted. Um, but I think it, it became a kind of symbiotic relationship in the sense that I think Magnum suddenly realised that they needed him as much as he needed Magnum because he had these roots into the editorial world. This is from Signs of the Times. I mean, that's a. That was on the cover of the book, the light switch. We wanted a cottagey, stately home kind of feel. I remember the caption. And then, of course, quite quickly, he became very famous and very rich. He rapidly became one of the top earners of Magnum. King's Cross Station. So it's all to do with the empire and the collapse of the empire. Determined to respond to the critical unease from Magnum and others, Parr embarked on a major new project in 1985. The last resort was heavily criticised for being an exploitation of working classes. I, I knew in my own mind that, you know, uh, this is slightly unfair in so far that I'm interested in photographing and exploiting all classes. You know, I'm as middle class as you can get, and here you were in the Thatcher time, you know, which I disapproved of, and yet I was flourishing as a photographer, so I felt almost slightly guilty at doing quite well. So it just suddenly struck me that the one class in British society that hadn't really been documented uh, were the middle classes, so this was the inevitably the next project that I should do. Once again, Parr immersed himself for three whole years in the world his pictures documented. Only this time, it was his hometown of Bristol and the surrounding suburbs of Middle England. When you have a subject as big as middle classes, you cannot photograph everything. So I had to make a, a, a decision as to what I would photograph. Well, I guess it was Thatcherism at its absolute peak, and within that theme, there are various ideas. There's uh, the tradition, there's the consumerism, there's the heritage, um, there's the sort of new classes. I still think that that was, really was his best, best series of photographs, because it was so, it was so accurate and so well observed, but also it, it, escape that talent that Martin did have of, you know, middle-class photographer going to photograph working-class people. In a way, it was almost a self-portrait because he was aspiring, they were aspiring, so there was a kind of uh, rather nice equality, I think. about Small World? The Small World was um, a project about global tourism and I guess really at the end of the 80s I decided to photograph not just in Britain and Ireland but to go and travel further afield and I thought a project on tourism would be a very good way of sort of tying up all these loose ends. Tourism by that time had become the biggest industry in the world. The great thing about tourism is you can exploit the difference between the sort of reality of a place 
and the mythology of a place. Because when you think about the pyramids, when you think about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you have this image in your mind because they're, they're places that we know about. And when you get there, you find the actual reality of having to queue and go around here and be there with thousands of other people at the same time is often quite disappointing. So uh, this is why it was a perfect project to look at photographically. The biggest subject that I have is the wealth of the Western world. You know, I mean, this is the, the thing for the last 10 years that I've been exploring in many different ways, in some detail, in some depth. And to me, it's the biggest story going. While in recent years, Parr's work has expanded its range, both politically and geographically, commenting on the global village we now live in, the way his pictures express his ideas continues to become ever more distanced and oblique. His subjects have become more conceptual, but he's never lost his profound sense of the absurd. What, what are we looking for? So one, one of the projects that I'm working on, uh, which is to do with the whole idea of globalization, is this thing uh, about parking spaces. And what I'm looking to photograph is, uh, is the very last car parking space available in a car park on the grounds that this is the, the one thing that people are really looking for in life. There's one over there. project don't you think yeah it is it's bizarre really but um, strangely like with all these things when you look at all the pictures added together they're, they're often quite interesting uh, and you can tell very often which country that you're in whether it's China Japan uh, Mexico it's a bit bizarre so um, you know I don't know what I'll do with it yet but I'll definitely do something because I like this idea that um, it's the one thing that we're all looking for in life is someone to park the car. Common sense is a an extension of this idea about, about globalization, and it's, it's very, very vivid, almost garish, isn't a lot of it? Yes. I mean, th th this is really to do with the flotsam and jetsam of the consumer world of which we're all part, and many of these pictures were taken in America and in Japan, in Europe, of course, in Britain. And um, you know, I'm almost using the language of advertising. I mean, I'm exploiting this, using these bright, saturated colors to slightly subvert it. And uh, the other thing about this which is interesting is that no longer do people really feature in it that much. I mean, it's just, you might have a bit of person. Um, so you get around this problem of exploitation of people, because now you're exploiting things like junk food. And for me, it was, again, exciting, because I was using this new combination of the ring flash and the macro lens, which I started to take up in 95, out of almost a frustration of not being able to come in and get close enough to the subjects that I was interested in photographing in. And here, because it's a close-up lens, you can get as close as you like. And with the ring flash, you almost get this portable studio type of lighting. So you can photograph very quickly, um, but at the same time, very evenly, and with very strong saturation, because the, the colors come through very forcibly. Like we live in this sort of littered, branded, kind of unpleasant, slightly violent and seedy world, which is the new world order. And I think Martin has a almost uncanny knack of being able to, to to portray that and to be very, very selective. Martin will always find these rather tacky um, elements of, of any place. It's a very melancholic view of the world and very, very pessimistic, I think.
Photographers by nature are attracted to things that are very exotic. That's why you see many people do projects about circuses or indeed even war or even mental hospital. Uh, now people choose these subjects because they're inherently very dramatic. They don't choose these subjects because of their value uh, of you know, recording the society in which they live. And that's the thing that fascinates me about the value of documentary work. And, and I am very conscious of my responsibility as a documentary photographer to try and capture and interpret the times that we live in through photography. Leaks. There's the aubergine. We ate that aubergine um, Sunday night. It was very good. So uh, what are you looking for now? What, what... Just things that strike me as being um, you know, a good picture. It doesn't necessarily mean I'll use it if I have it printed. Now, I'm not expecting any of these shots here to be breakthrough images. They're just part of the archive of that aspect of Britain that I'm very happy to build up. It's almost like a kind of rage at, at what we've lost, but I think we never we didn't have it in the first place. That's where I disagree with Martin. I think Martin was a middle class person coming from the south of England, imagining a past which I don't and, and being very, very selective about what he saw. So it, if you take when Martin lived in Hebden Bridge, for instance, I mean, Hebden Bridge was, a, in my opinion, was a very, very dreary place. I mean, everything shut at five, you couldn't get anything. It was very, very cold and miserable, I think. But Martin found this other thing in it, like a magic thing. And, and I think he's very selective in being able to take out of a place what it is that he needs or wants. Um, all the time that he's raging in a way against the loss of this kind of innocence and against things like consumerism and globalization, all those things. Um, he maybe doesn't take into account the fact that these things have offered an awful lot to ordinary people. Well, if I think about what's happening in the world, you know, seriously, it's, it's pretty depressing. You know, uh, we're going to run out of um, resources, uh, you know, everything's going down the pan and when countries like China come on board and they all demand and will get fridges, cars and everything like that, you know, the severe pressure on the world are going to mount up and become problematic. So, you know, uh, although I'm an optimist, when I actually do seriously think about the future of the world in which we live, um, I also end up being pretty sad and depressed. Mm -hmm.